good afternoon uh indeed after a passionate speech by her it is really numbing to hear somebody going through this suffering and we are all academically talking about terror uh the tone for this topic as actually indeed said by the keynote speaker when he said i'm worried whether it is about ideology or business criminal business in fact my topic is today to tell you just exactly whether it we it's any more an ideology it's a business before i go to the terror economics i'll just point out one common fact that liquid gas is the life blood of every activity commercial or criminal and efficiency and prudence of management of liquid gas is critical to commercial growth efficient management you have high growth societies like the oecd countries and if you control and track the gas optimally you control the organized crime better so effective control low crime societies no wonder that with the disruption of the high denomination notes we have all been talking of economic talking of economic growth go down did you notice that the crime also went down there is a but bottoming out of the crime the trade and crime both have crim- globalized and the criminal sy- criminal syndicates use the same channels same systems as the commercial systems the terror operators are no more terror leaders or ideological leader they are out running the organization like i said like ceos what drives the terror is it ideology or business or maybe both have you noticed that all most of these terrorists love dollars all of them had us but they all love dollars all the currency is in us dollars another commodity they love is the gold next to us dollars another thing you will see on you that the rogue economics as popularized by some economists including mrs uh, napotelani loretta napotelani that it is the rogue economics which is actually driving the terror if you see the evolution of terror funding initially it was state sponsored mostly it was a, a part of adversarial state policy whether it is nicaragua's contra funding or kashmir pakistan funding of kashmir though they will say it is only moral support but we all know it's beyond moral then it went to ira which was basically private funding where they own the malls business where they f- generated the funds themselves to the globalization of illegal trade with both al qaeda and is if you noticed while osama bin laden had lot of personal funds they did make lot of money out of the trade illegal trade and the isis if you say the brazenness which they are doing is because of the amount of money the oil trade had estimated that the in 2015 they made around 500 million from oil trade around 360 million from the extortion and taxation in the area occupied by them and 500 million they made from the banks from whose vaults in the occupied area they occupied in mosul in 2014 they made 500 million dollars terrorism is actually a business of low investment and high return and it is the rogue economics that actually is funding terror if we want to understand terror away from ideology it has mutated actually into a global business of terror as my previous speaker all said it probably has become an industry the principal avenues of rogue economics are globally drug trafficking illicit trade like smuggling counterfeiting piracy etc the financial crimes banking frauds credit online credit card insurance all kinds of banking bank related frauds human trafficking prostitution organized crime and fake currency many of us believe the fake currency printed by neighboring states as an adversarial economic policy you know it's funding the terrorism because if you see a 1000 rupee note when it was existing earlier now probably they will fake the 2000 rupees note as well the printing cost is around 39 per 1000 39 rupees raw material cost distribution cost printing cost and they used to sell it at around 
40, 40 rupees. That means 1,000 rupees will be sold at 400 rupees, a discount. So the balance is the profit. On an estimate by the <coughs> committee laid by the, the white paper on FICN had estimated that in eight, 2008 and nine. We had ISI, ISI has probably pumped in around 3,200 crores into India, and if you see, the profit was around 500 crores, and that's the money they use. They're literally frying the fish in the fish oil. The local factors are the illicit trade in parallel economy and the mining. If you see, strangely, the mining map of India and the Maoist map of India, if you superimpose, they will probably a exact match because of the huge amount I was commissioner in Bhubaneswar for some time and the western part of Orissa having mining was under my charge you used to know how much of extortion the per truck the amount of levy which is never reported the mines that they dug up there was no record of how much mining ores have been dug up so most of this mining illegal mining and the levy corruption real estate the financial crimes, drug trafficking, and organized crime may not be necessarily in that order. The terror funding in Indian context, a speaker after me will speak on a particular case of Kashmir funding. In India particularly, it is state-sponsored by a dear neighbor of ours with who, who have not been able to get over their the partition dilemmas. The fake currency, as I spoke of, which is partly economy driven, largely terror, fund cap seed capital driven, the drugs, we are a transit country, situated between Golden Triangle and Golden Crescent, and the charity, Jakarta. The internal factors in India are the illicit trade, the smuggling, illegal mining, proxy imports, which is you call Benami imports, charity, donation and organized crime and extortion. Even though the Daud is no more in India is operating out of Karachi, the extortion empire in Bombay still runs and it's a big business. How does the rogue money move? Physical movement, it has become difficult with advanced scanners at the airports, the cash couriers are also difficult, they run the risk of interception, the airports have become smart airports. Now, the Azold Hawala, which was operating in the Middle East and Southeast Asia after 9-11 due to a lot of monitoring and pressure, it has also dwindled. The banking channels, the front end, the, through RTGS and where, uh, where transfers due to layered proxies is also still being used, but it has dwindled. The biggest channel now is the trade-based money laundering. Uh, according to John Danovich, the professor who did maximum study on this, after 9-11, we have tightened, bolted the front door, which is uh, the money laundering, the banking sector, the formal bank banking sector is the front door of money laundering, but the back door is wide open. The back door is this trade-based money laundering. It is estimated that in two-third of, two of black money moving around in the world is through the trade, trade-based money laundering. This uh, next is the commodity-based money laundering, which is diamond, gold, drugs, etc. One interesting facet I can tell you: one of my contacts in uh, World Gold Council three months back said that sir, Mosul is falling. I said how? He said because suddenly the gold there is been 2.5 tons gold ordered by ISS because the amount of money they had as war chest which was around $1 billion in $100 bill notes, they were converting into gold. They won't do it unless they know that they're moving out. To give you an idea very briefly, <clears throat> to make $1 billion note, if you want to carry it in trucks, given the sheer size of the US dollar, it will need 40,000 cubic feet, which is be around 12, 40 feet containers. But if you convert into gold, the 2.5 ton would require only a trunk of the size of 2.5 feet, 1.5 feet, 1.5 feet. Given the size, the dimension of a gold, 1 kilo gold bar is 8 cm into 6 cm into 1.8 cm. That's, so you, yes sir. So that's easy. Only if you want to really control crime, 
the organized crime the terrorism you have to control this money movement and the gold movement others are the foreign donations charity some of the ngos possibly yes there is a case study from belgium which shows how the ngos have been used as money laundering rogue economics and security concerns the line is getting blurred the economic physical security and economic security <coughs> are interrelated it's no more a just a adversarial state policy there are larger dreams to that there is significant overlap of operators the rogue economics creates and sustains the systems and channels that are used by criminal syndicates hawala network financial network the neck dis check discounting benami accounting etc the forgery counterfeiting network document and id stealings the proxy operators who lend a name for consideration phones properties purchases etc the ground network of agents and beneficiaries and lastly the page patronage the politician executive and judicial patronage through inducements threat and blackmail they have their sympathizers let's admit the conclusion terrorism has mutated into a business of power and money cloaked in fundamentalism funded by rogue economics that requires little capital but gives huge return operators are very smart persons of very high iq with except who with exceptional guile and power of indoctrination have packaged their craving for power and wealth as idealism worth dying for cannot be neutralized only by guns comprehensive approach needed to check choke them economically i'll end this talk with a story from jataka where one of the disciples went to his guru and asked that i am tormented by a rodent who has become so powerful that he if i keep my food even hanging from the roof he is able to reach it how does this rodent become so powerful and so confident that he can reach anywhere he can jump from the floor to 10 feet high guru told him that it is the power look around he has amassed lot of wealth if you plug all the holes you will be able to neutralize his confidence that's the example i was giving compared to osama bin laden baghdadi is very brazen because he has billions of dollars at his command now that his empire is falling because of the attacks mosul has fallen it's because of the wealth we really want to neutralize terror we have to choke the financial supply lines unless we choke the financial supply lines we would not be controlled because they will get some of some idol there will be always young men frustrated unemployed disaffected willing to die for some consideration it is easy to brainwash to get them die for some cause as long as the operators have the indoctrination ability to say, create enough money it's ultimately the money that makes the crime thank you Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My thanks. Okay, so uh, this is.
Sure, sir. So, uh, my presentation is going to be on the funding of terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir. And uh, the way I'm going to outline it is uh, the first part will be how funds are raised. The second part will be uh, how funds are transferred into Jammu and Kashmir from Pakistan. And the third part will be on how the funds are distributed so as they reach the actual terrorist commanders. And of course, my experience as a police officer working in the field of counterterrorism will reflect uh, in what I have to say. So the organizations that I'm going to be uh, covering are basically uh, the Jamaat ud dawa and lashkar e taiba and the associated charity that is the Falai Insaniyat Foundation. Uh, the second is jaish e Muhammad <coughs> and the al Rahmat Trust, which is uh, the charity arm of uh, uh, jaish e Muhammad based in Bahawalpur. And the third organization is Hezbul Mujahideen. Between these three organizations, we uh, cover, you know, the, almost the entire terrorism uh, in Jammu and Kashmir. These are the major groups operating there. So uh, the first uh, part is raising raising funds. How are the funds raised? Uh, raising money by charities. Now, interestingly, in the last uh, decade or so. Uh, these major terrorist organizations operating in Jammu and Kashmir, but based in Pakistan, they've uh, uh, big charities uh, have spawned, which are associated with these uh, organizations. Uh, the on the left side, that is the pamphlet. This is uh, the al uh, pamphlet of the Al Rahmat Trust soliciting contributions for sacrificing uh, animals during the Eid festival. And the Falai Insaniyat Foundation, which is the charity wing of uh, the lashkar e -Taiba. And Falai Insaniyat Foundation is uh, ostensibly, the, uh, it is apparently the largest NGO in Pakistan and the fastest growing NGO in Pakistan. Uh, we can see in the uh, picture here, uh, Hafiz Sayyid and Hafiz Abdul Rahof. The Amir, Hafiz Sayyid is the Amir of Jamaat ud dawa uh, Hafiz Abdul Rahof is the uh, Amir of FIF. Both of them are addressing the volunteers and FIF is growing to I mean it's it's really growing expanding to a number of fields in fact undertaking certain functions which uh, were strictly in the uh, in the uh, domain of the state so far so they have an entire network of fire tenders for example which I don't think there is an equivalent organization in India but probably to you know uh, capturing space where the state is absent for lack of resources or whatever. Okay, uh, so how are these charities uh, raising funds? Uh, collection outside mosques, street collections. I have a small video. If it works, I'll just in internet. Sorry, it's. Sorry, it's not working. So uh, the video shows uh, two people, uh, you know, collecting, soliciting funds for jihad, and uh, in the presence of Pakistan Rangers. And this video is apparently shot in Karachi, where you have a full-fledged operation being conducted by Rangers since September 2013 to flush out terrorists, targeted killings, etc. And this collection, it's available on YouTube. I mean, if you search Jaish e Mohammed collection of funds, uh, you will get this video. Uh, then these charities organize special campaigns uh, in natural disasters during the uh, festival of Ramzan soliciting zakat and fitrana which are uh, kind of arms given by uh, Muslims and also uh, in August 2016 we saw uh, some of these organizations setting up stalls for uh, for the Kashmir cause. So here is, uh, you know, on the left side is a pamphlet of the Jamaat ud dawa This is the insignia of the Jamaat ud dawa uh, soliciting fitrana, that is mandatory donations during uh, Eid al-Fitr uh, of 100 rupees. This is uh, a, a report published in the Tribune of Pakistan, which shows a, uh, a special camp set up by the FIF 
अंडर द नेम ऑफ तहरीक आज़ादी जम्मू एंड कश्मीर ऑन वन ऑफ दी क्रॉसिंग्स सीकिंग अगेन डोनेशंस एंड आई एम नॉट श्योर इफ यू कैन रीड वॉट सेट इन देयर आई मीन अपेरेंटली इट इज इलीगल द राइटर राइट्स इट्स इलीगल बट इट सेज दी स्टॉल्स आर ऑल ओवर द प्लेस Okay, and then uh, online collections. Again, I'll show you. This is the home page of the website of yes, uh, home page of the website of the Falai and Sanit Foundation. Uh, you can see th they're soliciting donations online. Uh, it's devoted to humanity dot dot org. Uh, private donations, and then one of the major sources of funds is the raising uh, the sacrifice of animals and collection of and sale of hides uh, during Eid ul Adha. This is again a newspaper report in the dawn, which shows Jaisi Mohammed and uh, how Jamaat ul Dawa have collected like hides worth millions of dollars from across, uh, you know, Pakistan. Seven. Uh, this is a 2012 report, and it says 780 million Pakistani rupees worth of hides were collected by these organizations. Uh, then they have profit generating businesses. Again, this is Takwa Model Schools. started by uh, the jamaat ud dawa these are modern schools and here is the fee structure is given on their website which in the context of south asia is fairly you know it's it's expensive it's targeted to middle class upper middle class and you know here modern education would typically be mixed with uh, you know traditional religious uh, education and uh, fake indian currency notes so we, i have two examples in mind david coleman headley before his seventh visit to india in, uh, in september 2007 he was given fake currency notes by an isi officer called major iqbal in lahore and which he spent in mumbai while he was doing uh, the reconnaissance for the mumbai attacks uh, bahadur ali another let operative arrested in july 2016 from kashmir uh, he was carrying 23000 rupees part of the money has pro is uh, was fake high quality fake indian currency notes and then finally bank rolling by state institutions again uh, i'll cite the example to david coleman headley uh, when he met mr uh, major iqbal the isi man handling him for the first time in lahore he was given 25000 dollars in cash which he spent for his operations here now uh, i come to the second part transfer of funds so cash is carried by infiltrating terrorists uh, usually they would have some anything Uh, around fifty thousand Indian rupees with them, and as soon as they come in, they meet the commander. They hand over the cash to the commander. Hawala operations, informal operations. Uh, I everybody probably knows what hawala is. Informal transactions where cash is not actually transferred, but it's trans uh, it's based on trust, and uh, usually small amounts, small tranches are transferred th through this, and we'll see exactly how it is distributed. uh formal banking channels their use has declined because of you know mechanisms like the fatf uh, which you know have expanded in their uh, scope uh, and they're looking up uh, they're also looking at uh, terrorism financing especially since uh, 911 cross loc trade this is a confidence building measure that was entered into between the governments of india and pakistan in 2008 there are indications that this route is being used by some terrorist organizations by under invoicing of uh, exports from pakistan so in effect the result is the same as a hawala operation you're transferring money to india to jammu and kashmir and finally transactions between persons living on different sides of the loc which is like so somebody two brothers one living on the other side of the loc one here if they if he sells ancestral land and he has to get the money transferred to his brother he will uh probably get it he, he you know he can get, get it done through a lashkar or an hm person this actually is uh, pretty much in use by the hizbul mujahideen more than any other organization now the final part the distribution of funds the funds have come through hawala or through this uh trade route how do they get distributed you have a terrorist commander he will normally have a few groups of uh, og the overground workers that's what we call they're basically t supporters who do all kinds of logistical uh, who do all kind of logistical support to the uh, terrorists so these are independent not known to each other a uh, terrorist commander will typically have four or five such groups and uh, you know 
one of these groups in in turns these groups will be asked to you know go and collect the money from the hawala operator sir just one more slide so uh, he will uh, collect the money typically in srinagar from a trader that guy will be the hawala operator uh, once they get the money then through a long chain of work around workers it could be two or three persons in between the money will reach the the terrorist commander that is the way it happens so the district uh, the mechanism it i i believe it was not always like that it has evolved and it is a very optimal strategy because of the following reasons uh so if one cell is so because of the independent cell of ogws if one is apprehended you don't get the others hawala transactions no paper trails therefore almost impossible to obtain evidence and uh, prosecute uh, cash transfers in small amounts so you break it down in tranches uh, if you know your one transaction gets detected caught uh, interdicted uh, rest of your money is safe and then long chain of delivery of funds so you just keep you know you build this long chain which confounds you know monitoring of the trail by uh, law enforcement or security so that's it thank you very much I don't know if you guys can see that actually. Can you see it? All right, so I'm blind as a bat. It's called menopause and it's getting worse. All right, so I'm going to do a little bit of a switcheroo and let me tell you why. Um, that whole menopause thing, my memory going bad. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about women, but I'm going to talk about women in a, in a different way. So the one thing that I've been struck by is that if you look at the scholarship of, of terrorism, there are different kinds of research methodologies. And each of these methods have their strengths and they have their weaknesses. So on the one hand, you have what I'm going to call the ethnographic approach. And a really good example of a bad example um, is this book, uh, speaking of menopause, I forget her name, uh, that came out from the University of Chicago Press, which was an ethnography of uh, Jamaat Islami and Lashkar Taiba. And in these ethnographic approaches, what scholars will do is that they'll ensconce themselves in a very local area and they'll do countless in depth interviews with specific individuals. And they'll continue doing those interviews until the, the margin of information obtained in the N plus one interview is as close to zero as possible. So the advantage of, of an ethnographic approach is that you get really finely detailed information, but the downside is you have no idea how representative it is, right? So is this particular mahalla in the old city of Lahore behind Mochi Gate actually telling you anything that you can generalize beyond that particular locality in Pakistan, much less generalize to another country, right? So you're trading off depth for breadth. Then at the other extreme, you have these quantitative researchers. Um, and in interest of full disclosure, I do both kinds of research. Um, so I'm not micturating on one or the other. Um, so at the other extreme, you have what I'll call the, the laptop warriors. They don't go out and collect their own data because that actually requires risk. Most importantly, it requires money and scholars are not notorious for having money. So they'll use data sets that are already there. For example, um, the data that Pew collects under the Global Attitude Survey. And what Pew does is that they have a relatively set number of questions that they feel to Muslims in a variety of countries as diverse as Morocco to Malaysia. And the data warriors sit there and they run their models. Um, and what they're trying to find are things that are generalizable across all of these countries. Now, this is, what, this is how you get published 
in uh, articles or in journals like the Journal of Conflict Resolution, but doesn't actually tell us much about what we're observing. Because if something can be generalized from Morocco to Malaysia, it's probably not that interesting, right? Gravity can be generalized, but we're not that interested in gravity. So what I've been trying to do in my work on Pakistan is sort of tread a middle path. I'm very skeptical of these multi-country studies. And let me give you a really good example of why the multi-country studies are raise my hackles. So it's a very common model that you'll see where you'll have your dependent variable is support for suicide terrorism. This is a variable that Pew always collects. And Pew also asks a very silly question about do you want more Sharia or less Sharia? And so for those of you who remember, uh, I think we did this in the fifth grade, which is estimate uh, the line y equals mx plus b. Well, that's essentially what a regression is. So when you put that into the machine, you're always going to get a relationship between support for suicide bombing and Sharia. And because the numbers are big, it is the law of big numbers that that relationship will be significant. And this is a very typical interpretation. An increase in support of Sharia by 13% results in a 12% increase in support for suicide bombing. Read countless papers. But here's the problem. What is Sharia? We don't actually know what that is. So uh, in my work in Pakistan, it's been my general experience that people think that Sharia is a means by which they have access to cleaner government. Less bribes, the police don't will take your FIR <laughs> without having to, to bribe them. You can get your, uh, your identity papers without paying a bribe. This is a very different interpretation that I support Sharia, which is cleaner government, and this is why I support in certain kinds of terrorists. It's a very different interpretation if we believe that individuals think Sharia is whipping, stoning, beheading, and so forth. And that's why they support terrorism. Right? So you can see how you could have a very problematic reading of these data because you don't know what that variable is. So in my work on Pakistan, um, I'm trying to tread both paths in the sense that we're trying to rely upon some of the qualitative work that we've done, but also take advantage of large numbers. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to say here as I, as I go into this presentation, I don't want anyone to leave this room thinking that what I'm going to say is generalizable to Egypt or Iran. Uh, in, in, I'm very strongly of the belief that this kind of work, that when it's good, it's specific and this necessarily means we can't go around applying uh, this, these insights to other conflict areas. Why is this a problem? Well, for any of you that's worked in an embassy, no one wants to hear this, right? So I'm going to tell you about a little bit about USAID and why they make me cross. All right, so USAID has so much money, although uh, Hair Trump, as I like to call him, which is both a play on words because of his hair and also a reference to his white, his, his white supremacist nonsense, but uh, who knows, he might take all that money away. But before Trump, USAID had a lot of money. So if you think about the transaction costs of writing a contract, no one wants to write 200 contracts for $10,000. Right, because it takes the same amount of time to write a contract for ten thousand dollars versus four million. So the way USAID works is that they have a five Beltway bandits corral. They write them big institutional checks, and then it's their job to start executing. What's the easiest and most efficient way of doing this is that you have a cookie cutter program. Right, we did this in Colombia, we did it in Peru, and now we're going to do it in Pakistan. Right, this is this is how it's done. So you have this whole business called countering violent extremism. We have it. DFID has it. The Canadians have it. Anyone with money to waste has a CVE program. But the problem with CVE, apart from the fact that it doesn't work, um, is the fact that it is built around certain assumptions about who needs to be de-radicalized. Incidentally, I don't like the word radical at all because once you call someone radical, you stop seeking the explanations for, for their behavior. And my work on Lashkar Taiba and the book that I'm doing 
These guys are very rational. There's nothing radical about them. They're actually joining an organization because they support the mission. In fact, it looks an awful lot like why my brothers joined the U.S. Army at 16, right? But would we ever, we, would we ever say the U.S. Army radicalized my brothers at 16? Probably be, you know, tossed out of the room um, if someone actually said that. So, um, so my approach to this is, is, is really quite different. Um, I want to turn this idea of CVE sort of on its head. The assumption of countering violent extremist programming is that we should be looking at males of military age. Now, why do we think this? Well, I think part of the reason, especially when we start talking about Islamist terrorism, and I'm saying this word very carefully to echo what my friend and colleague Praveen Swami said, we're not talking about Muslim terrorism. We're not talking about Islamic terrorism. Islamic terrorism would be a terrorist who also does calligraphy. We're talking about acts of terrorism that's committed in the name of political Islam, right? So we're being very, very specific about what we mean. So looking at the profiles of different militants in these different areas of operations, we tend to see that men dominate, right? That they're overlooking the human capital of women. So most CVE programming takes as its assumption that we should be looking at men of military age. Well, my brothers are military recruiters. Now, they will tell you that they spend much more time recruiting the parent than they do the kid. And the reason is we sign on the line at 16. Got to have both parents' permission. 16-year-old, you can t pretty much convince them to do anything. A parent, not so much. And I find a lot of similarities in the work I've been doing on Lushkar Taiba, which is it's very much a family affair. Lushkar wants the mothers to give them blessings. Um, there's a lot of similarities to how Lushkar works and how I see gangs of Chicago working. They take care of the families. So when a kid gets killed, they take care of the funeral. It's a big deal. They want to make sure that that family will continue supporting the mission. So the idea that we are not looking at women, I think, is a very, very big problem. So what I'm going to do very briefly, because i got two minutes, I'm going to uh, give you some empirical data. When I proposed this, I thought Lushkar Taiba was in this data set, and I said to my RA, go run these models for me. To my surprise, it wasn't Lushkar Taiba. We got Lushkar Jungvi and Afghan Taliban. I gave him the wrong data set, and he couldn't, he couldn't redo the, the numbers for me. But I think this is going to illustrate where I'm going. And in two weeks, I'll have the Lushkar Taiba data. So what I want to look at here is... Um, why or how does gender affect support for different terrorist groups? So I'm going to be using the data set, the wrong data set, because I don't have Lushka in this one. But we've got about 16,000 people, um, 3,000 of which were in FATA. And our, our dependent variable is support for two very different but also related terrorist organizations. One is Sipe Sabe Pakistan. It also goes by the name of Lushkar e Jungvi. Um, basically, this is a group that kills Pakistanis. Um, in the early days of the 90s, it also helped uh, participate with the Taliban. It's an important history where this organization also forged ties with Al Qaeda. So, when in the uh, much before the emergence of ISIS, if there was an Al Qaeda attack, LEJ would often be the executor of it, even though Al Qaeda was the imaginer of it. Now, in the post ISIS world, we're seeing some of these guys. Um, they went to the Pak Taliban, now they're defecting to ISIS. And the reason for that is these guys are sectarian, right? They not only kill and slaughter Shia and Emadis, they're also going after Brailvis. And of course, Christians and Hindus and every once in a while a Sikh is also fair game. The other group that we're looking at is the Afghan Taliban. Now, these groups are both Deobundi. Right? They, they share an, a, a, an archipelago of madrasas. They both rely upon the Jamiatul Islam uh, ulama uh, for political cover, but also religious cover. But the difference is that in the case of the Afghan Taliban, no matter what Durrani Sahib says, we have the state actively behind it, promoting it, helping it, aiding, abetting it in every which way imaginable. And SSP, or LEJ, the state sometimes goes after it when it becomes a big nuisance, but it really suffers from benign neglect. 
And there's political reasons for that. Um, obviously, uh, Nawaz Sharif doesn't want to alienate them because they're competitors. But then the other issue is that LEJ, like the Afghan Taliban, also have overlapping networks with Jaish and Muhammad, which is another group that Pakistan aids and abets to kill Indians. So it doesn't have an incentive to really crack down. And with the Islamizing project of the state, quite frankly, and though this may sound cruel, Pakistanis aren't getting terribly upset. That, that Barelvis, Sunnis, or excuse me, Shia and Emadis are being slaughtered, much less uh, uh, non-Muslim minorities. So let me just get to the chase. And this is, this is it, dude. Our timing is perfect. And this is a fascinating, what? Right now. Seriously, I'm wrapping it up. Dave Chappelle, his wrap it up meter is right here. This is it. When we ran this regression, he found something absolutely fascinating. Women were significantly more likely to support this sectarian group than were men. Not surprisingly, they were not that supportive of the Afghan Taliban. The Afghan Taliban have a pretty bad rap when it comes to women. So I'm not that surprised that women were like, oh, I'm not so, I'm not so into the Afghan Taliban. Um, layer on top of that... Um, racist views about Pashtuns and how they treat women and obviously the relationship between Pashtuns and the Taliban. But this is an enormous puzzle. What is going on that women prefer sectarian terrorists? I have to say I was really surprised to, this, surprised to see this. So Amuz Bush, when I, I'm going to do a very similar analysis of another data set that actually does include questions about Lashkar Taiba. And I can't answer that question right now. Unlike SSP, LET has an enormous infrastructure dedicated to recruit women. It has an entire publication branch that targets women. It has women's ijtamas. Women are members of the organization. They're given political freedom to move around the country without anyone questioning their honor because their hijab kebobbed up. But I have not any possible explanation as to why women would support a group that provides no public goods whatsoever. They're not doing Jamaat al-Dawah, health care clinics. They're not providing anything except death. So if any of you have any ideas, um, I can't find any SSP publications. I, and in short, I, I can't come up with any data-driven explanation to unravel this puzzle of why women are supporting this group that do nothing but kill. Thank you. Take questions for the others later. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question is to the gentleman from.